Welcome back to I Join Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. My name is Victor Shi, a sophomore at UCLA, the youngest elected delegate for Joe Biden, and one of the co-hosts of this podcast. I'm Jill Wine-Banks, the other co-host and also a Biden delegate for the last uh, election. I'm also the wearer of Jill's pins, and today's pin is a clear clue to who our wonderful guest is because it is a readout pin. And so that's a pretty big clue. Um, regular listeners of our podcast know the amount of time that we spend covering the importance of facts as the foundation for meaningful conversations and policy debates. Today, we'll be talking about that and more with our guest, a prominent anchor who represents the future of journalism. She has an impressive background, starting from being an Ivy League graduate to hosting an MSNBC primetime show, the first African-American woman to do so. Um, as Jill said, she's none other really than Joy Reid. Joy is one of my favorite anchors at MSNBC, and I'm honored to have been able to be on her morning weekend show, AM Joy, and now on her new primetime show, Readout. After graduating from Harvard in 1991 with a degree in film studies, Joy began her career working for a business consulting firm in New York. She then changed careers to journalism in 1997 at a news station in South Florida. In 2003, she took a brief um, break from journalism to work for America Coming Together, an organization dedicated to opposing the Iraq War. In 2006, she returned to journalism, this time as co-host of Wake Up South Florida, a morning radio talk show. And in 2008, she worked in Obama's presidential campaign. A few years later, Joy served as managing editor of The Grio, a news organization dedicated to covering the uh, events and news of African-American citizens. During much of this time, Joy was also a political columnist for the Miami Herald and the editor of the Reed Report, which was a blog. She joined MSNBC again in 2014 as host of the Reed Report show and later as a national correspondent before becoming the host of the weekend AM Joy show and now the host of a primetime show the readout. She is the author of two books, Fracture, Barack Obama, the Clintons, and the Racial Divide, and more recently, The Man Who Sold America, Trump and the Unraveling of the American Story. I am so excited to have Joy on iGen Politics and can't wait for you all to hear what Joy has to say about her life and her career and the current state of politics. Thank you so much for being with us today, Joy. It is great to be here. It's always great to be here with you, uh, anywhere with you, Jill, because I adore you. Thank you. And Victor, so, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. So uh, those, have, those who have followed you on MSNBC, I think, have seen your brilliant analysis of the news of the day, the drama of your delivery. But because one of the things that we try to do um, on our podcast is try to allow our audience to understand um, who our guest is. I'd love to actually begin with a um, 2013 interview that you gave that may give some insight into how you got to where you are today. Um, so you said that Harvard was drastically different from where you grew up in terms of demographics. So I'm wondering, what were the demographics where you grew up compared to Harvard? And were you prepared for that moment um, when you first stepped foot on Harvard campus? Yeah, it was it was it was the opposite in every way. I mean, I grew uh, I was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York, but uh, grew up in Denver, Colorado, in a town called Montbello, which was basically a black suburb, a majority black suburb um, of Denver. And so, whereas Denver is probably, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe five percent uh, African American, um, Montbello was eighty percent black. And, you know, and actually specifically African-American. So it was about maybe, you know, of the other remaining 20 percent, um, probably half of that was Mexican-American, not broadly Latino, just Mexican-American. There was not a whole lot of diversity in that in that cohort. And then there were Asian-Americans or there was a Hmong community and uh, and then a white community. And that was it. And the way that Montbello basically was formed, it was what I call an upside down town that was formed by white flight. So when black um, professionals started moving into Montbello, doctors and lawyers and judges, et cetera, white uh, Denverites moved out. 
And so the only white Americans who were left were generally working class white Americans who really couldn't afford to move or didn't choose to move away um, and be a part of that white flight. So it was it was an interesting town in which the more affluent people in the town were black and the less affluent people tended to be white. Um, you know, on the block where we we started out living on the working class side uh, when we first moved there and then eventually moved to the other side, which on our block was a judge and, you know, retired military people and, you know, lawyers and doctors were on our block um, and they were all black. And the one or two white families that were there, um, you know, were sort of less well off than the black families. It was just an, an interesting dynamic. Um, when I got to Harvard, it was the opposite. Um, it was a town of not only wealthy um, white uh, majority, but a super majority, but people who were, you know, three generation, four generation Harvard. Uh, I went to school with uh, a girl whose last name was Wigglesworth, which was one of the names of the dorms. <laughs> they had to make sure that they didn't put her in that dorm because she was a Wigglesworth. And so the wealth and the uh, sort of privilege and the sort of inherited wealth, I had never seen anything like that. You know, um, affluent to me were the people on my block growing up in Montbello, not people like that. And even the black folks there were really wealthy and, and from private schools. So it was just a very different environment. Definitely. So how did your time at Harvard, I guess, shape your worldview and who you are today and like what you do now? Well, you know, Harvard was the first place um, where you know, my intellect was questioned. You know, I mean, I was a, a nerdy kid, you know, who always did really well in school. And no one ever questioned that until I got to Harvard, in which, you know, white students questioned whether we black students who were all either, you know, private school black kids or nerdy black kids like me who had been to public school and got all A's. Um, but yet you had white students questioning whether we belong there, whether affirmative action was some illegitimate means of our being on the same campus with them. And in many cases, we had higher PSAT scores and better grades in high school than they did. And a lot of them got in because they were legacies, because their grandfather went there. They're, yet they still thought to question our presence. And it was the first time that had ever happened to me you know, of somebody, you know, questioning my validity as an, in, as an intellect. Um, and it was unpleasant, you know, Harvard was not the most pleasant environment, honestly, for me, also life circumstances. My mother had just passed away. So I was officially an orphan and I was, you know, dealing with depression and all of the things that go with that. So it was challenging. Um, and I wound up taking a year off from it because it was just, it was too much, I think, that mm -hmm. freshman year. That's so interesting. And it's, not that different for women at Columbia Law School, uh, where we were a minority and had better uh, LSAT scores because that was the only way we could get in because there was a quota. But um, let's move to your journalism career because it's a fascinating career. And one of the things that's very interesting to me is how you've been able to work in traditional media while simultaneously advocating for diversity in the newsroom and for expressing your political views, including going back as far as your opposition to the war in Iraq and um, working to increase African-American representation in journalism. So, and you've amazingly been able to find a great network to allow you to do this. So how do you manage to cover the facts while also shining a light on the politics of race and identity and just politics in general? Well, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, and I appreciate the, the, the way can you frame that question, because in this sort of the media that I started out in, you know, my first my first job was actually at a Fox affiliate in Miami. But when I got to NBC um, is when I wrote this op ed um, uh, opposing the war uh, in in Iraq. Uh, this was in 2003. And this is what shows you the importance of intersectional allies. There was a cranky old white guy named Ike Siemens um, who had introduced me to uh, the first black editor of the Miami Herald editorial page because he knew I loved to write. And the way that Ike and I became friends is that Ike would bring in all his old books. He, he had tons of books. And he would bring in books uh, every month and put them in a, on, on a desk and say, anyone who wants the books can take them. And I was pretty much the only one who took them. And I would take them all. Like, I took all of these books. And he's like, nobody ever takes these books. Nobody around here reads. I like you. You read. So we became fat, uh, friends. We were like sort of the most unlikely uh, duo. 
Um, and he introduced me to the guy who actually hired me to write these op-eds. So my very first op-ed, the first thing I got published was opposing the war, but they made a mistake of accidentally putting my work email rather than my personal email in it. So I darn near got fired. And it was Ike who said, you've got a First Amendment right to have your opinion. They're not going to touch you. You stand up for what you believe in and kind of back me up. And so it just does show it's important to have allies, yes. uh, intersectional allies in these um, industries, because I almost got fired for writing that op-ed. Ultimately, I decided I really couldn't stay in the in the business. Um, I was a digital editor and just decided to leave and go work in politics because I just couldn't. To me, I felt that the media, not just you know where I was working, but in general, the media was cheerleading a war that I thought was wrong. And I just didn't want to be a part of that. And so I ended up working in politics, um, trying to oust George W. Bush in the 2004 election, working for America Coming Together, which is where I learned that George Soros um, is considered the enemy of the people to a lot of people because we worked, you know, George Soros' money was funding us. And we were being attacked constantly as like puppets of George Soros. And I'm like, who is this guy? Why are people vilifying him? He turns out to be this lovely, sweet old guy who has a lot of money and wants to change the world for the better. Like, hello. And so the way that I wound up back in uh, what would be opinion journalism is that I decided that writing that op-ed and doing that kind of work is more what I was interested mm -hmm. in. After the um, after we lost in 2004, I wound up in talk radio, um, writing op-eds, doing things like that because I felt like I have something to say, even though I was you know young and you know only had that one campaign experience. I was like, I have a voice and I can use it. Um, and so I was lucky enough to wind up getting hired by the Grio. Um, which was then owned by NBC. So I wound up back in the NBC family, but in a position where I was in charge, where I was the managing editor and could sort of decide what the editorial voice was going to be for the Grio. And we were able to talk about issues that were important to black Americans, to, you know, to the black community um, with the, the, the NBC journalism sort of family around us and supporting us and able to tell those stories, a lot of them Black Lives Matter. So I think the balance is that you know, when I was there doing, for instance, the Trayvon Martin story, I still had to interview George Zimmerman's lawyer every day. I had to have a, a relationship with him and talk to him and do stories that were fair to him, even though in my heart I felt he was guilty of sin, right? But I yeah. couldn't be editorializing about that. I had to report on it. I had to talk to Trayvon's mom even though my heart was breaking every time I spoke to her, but I had to interview her and get her to tell that horrible story of losing her son um, and so it's like you, the way you balance it is that there's the story you have to tell so that people can learn something from it. Um, and then there's your personal opinion, which isn't part of the story. And so it's a question of, you know, people used to ask me, especially black people, how do you even interview these parents who've lost kids in, um, to police shootings? How do you even do it and remain objective? You have to, because someone has to tell their story. And if it's your responsibility, you have to somewhat take yourself out of the picture and tell it. But the story you're telling is not, quote unquote, objective in the sense that there is a villain and there is a victim. And that's what I think we need to realize in journalism. Being objective doesn't mean there isn't a villain and that there isn't a victim. And, and is there a way to do that without crossing a line so that you move from shining a light on the facts to getting into amplifying your own personal political views or opinions? How do you manage it's that? Difficult. that? Yeah. It's difficult I, I would, because I'm an opinion journalist, right? So opinion journalists, we have a lot more latitude. We're able to, to, to do more analysis and have more of an opinion in terms of the story. So I'm not doing the Walter Cronkite, even though he also ultimately gave his take, his personal take. He said the war in Vietnam is a failure and it is over. And when he said that, it was over because that was his, uh, his studied opinion based on the facts. So he wasn't just throwing out his random opinion, but his opinion was definitive because he was the most influential yeah. human being in the United States, more so than the president of the United States, right? So when people say, do Walter what Walter Cronkite did, that's what he did. That's part of what he did was to say, I have analyzed this, and from my analysis, this war is wrong and it's done. And so I think we have to redefine what we mean by objective. We don't mean that you have no soul inside of your body. It doesn't mean that you can't see what you see. You know. And Jill, you, you, you've watched with me um, yeah. the progression of the Trump administration to what objectively is fascism in this country. And the reason that things like fascism fester is that no one wants to name it because they think not naming it is being objective. So it's a matter of you don't just give your unstudied opinion about things based on how you feel. 
You give your studied opinion on things based on what you see. And you have to be willing to see what you're seeing and not to deny it because you think that stating it is somehow not objective. What we're seeing now in terms of the vaccine, for instance, the, the, the bizarre things that people are saying about vaccination, the lies, it's not our opinion that those things are dangerous and wrong. They are dangerous and wrong. And I think when we hesitate as journalists to state that, we're actually doing a disservice to the public. Yeah. So you also, when you worked in politics, did that affect how you um, approach your show? Did you learn something about how media and campaigns interact that can help in covering that news? Oh, absolutely. I think um, I'm so glad that I actually worked on, after I worked on uh, the 2004 campaign, some friends of mine from that campaign were working on the Obama campaign. So I wound up working toward the end of that campaign in Florida. And I think that was invaluable experience because to understand how politics works, it helps to have worked in politics because some of the analysis that we're seeing about politics from the punditry is coming purely from the beltway and from people who experience politicians at lunches and dinners and at the bar, right? But not having worked in it. And I think it's important to know what you're seeing, not for what it looks like on the surface, but how politics and campaigns really work. So I think that experience was invaluable and helps me to do analysis that again, is not just my opinion off the top of my head, I've worked in that business. And, and one other question about journalism, which is nowadays with social media and even with some channels, uh, cable networks, spreading a lot of misinformation, disinformation, let's call it what it is, lies, um, how can news organizations combat that misinformation? How can you, for example, use your platform to reach out to people who might be listening to the false information about the lack of science that's being promoted uh, to get people to hear? And how do we get Fox viewers to listen to what are real facts? That is the billion dollar question right now, because I have to say perhaps the most dangerous individual um, in the world right now might be Rupert Murdoch, because what he's doing is knowingly allowing his networks and his media, that is not just Fox News, but all the media he's associated with, and then other people parrot what Fox is doing mm -hmm. to spread outright lies. Everyone at Fox is vaccinated. All of those, because they are the strictest of all the three networks between CNN, Fox, and MSNBC. They're the strictest about requiring vaccination to be in that building, to really? work there. You can't go near Tucker Carlson if you're not vaccinated. And yet these people are not being clear that they're vaccinated. Rupert Murdoch was one of the earliest people vaccinated. They're vaccinated. Wow. So for them to literally spread lies about vaccines and make their huge audience doubt the efficacy of vaccines or to believe bananas theories that it's going to turn you into a magnet or a zombie, it's so unethical. But what the way they get around it is when they get sued for it, like Tucker Carlson did, they say, well, no rational person would believe this is the news. <laughs> the problem is a lot of people believe that is the news. A lot of they're saying that no thinking person would believe that this is factual. It's entertainment. So they get away with it and they're not a broadcast network. So the FCC can't touch them, can't touch any of us in cable. You know, at NBC, we live under pra standards and practices. We would not be allowed to do that. You know, CNN has a standards and practices department. What Fox is doing, and they're, the people they're putting in the most danger are their own viewers. I genuinely yeah. don't understand the rationale behind it. It's cruel and it's hard to reach them because at this point, that point of view, that Trumpist, far right, crypto fascist sort of wing yeah. of our country is a cult and it's a religious cult. So you can't, it, it would be like trying to talk someone out of their religion. So honestly, the answer, Jill, is I don't know. I, just I don't know how you reach them. Yeah, I'm just hoping the Dominion and Smartmatic lawsuits may bankrupt Fox enough that it will have a, a measured effect on Fox and OAN and Newsmax and stop the spread of lies. And I, I know Victor yeah. wanted to follow up on Fox. Yeah, I mean, I know you haven't been shy about criticizing those on Fox News like Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity on your show. I'm wondering if you think that anything will get to Tucker and Sean and others on that channel to agree at least on the same facts that are broadcast on MSNBC and um, even on CNN. 
I don't know, because there's such a financial um, compulsion to do it, right? They're making lots of money over there, even though they have very few advertisers left. A lot of advertisers have left them. But uh, you know, because they are a direct carry, right? They're in basic cable. It's not based on ad revenue. It's based on how many people still subscribe to cable. And older people, you know, they're ba- Fox has the oldest viewership. It has the widest viewership. So older white Americans are still some of the biggest adherents to subscribing to cable. So they're not talking necessarily to younger people. They're talking to a very specific demographic. And the financial incentives are so strong. I don't see anything moving them away. I mean, Tucker has gone from... Raising doubts about the vaccination again, while not disclosing whether he's vaccinated, and I, my guess is he is, to then worshiping Viktor Orban, who is an outright fascist, and 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 saying that Orban's Hungary should be the model for the United States, and they're saying that on television every night with no consequences. So honestly, one of the reasons I love social media is it's one way to get around the Fox bubble because there are lots of people who hate follow me. <laughs> like They really despise me, but they follow me on Twitter. And sometimes a clip of something I'm saying will get there or get on TikTok or get on Facebook. And it sort of gets around. It's sort of like what George W. Bush used to say, go over the, what do you say? Go over the bubble <laughs> in his bushy in terms, jump over the bubble. And so sometimes you can sneak things in because what I love about when Fox News goes after me is at least they play the clip. So my thing is, at least if they play the clip of what I said, maybe someone out there will at least hear what was in the clip, too, and not just the bashing around the clip. Right. right. And then maybe hopefully go on your social media page and then consume what you have to tweet. Um, I I do have one other question. Do you ever talk to journalists at Fox News? Like, what do they think of Tucker and Sean and those who constantly use their platform to to spread misinformation? Are, Are they satisfied with that? I, I don't. I don't know folks over there. I know people who've worked in other levels there. Um, one of my executive producers, when I had a dayside show, actually came from Fox News. And he gave me a lot of insights into the way things work over there. And he worked in the Roger Ailes era. And the way he put it is that it's all about the bottom line. Um, he was there during the launch of the war on Christmas. And he said someone, some producer came up with it and they were like, this is great. This is going to be great ratings. And they launched this idea that liberals were waging war on Christmas and making it illegal to say Merry Christmas, which was complete BS. But it's all about ratings and it's all about the bottom line over there. And I don't think that anything will change, you know, the Laura Ingrams. I think Laura Ingram and Tucker are on a separate level of bad and Janine Pirro. To me, Sean Hannity, who I don't know personally, but I knew of him when I worked in talk radio. I knew people who knew him who said he's more mercenary than anything else. He's a Republican and he's pretty much on whatever the Republican line is at the moment. I, I see Tucker and Laura Ingram as just on a whole different level and Janine Pirro of insidiousness, really, um, and danger and threat. Um, and Tucker is the highest rated program on that network. And so he has the biggest voice and the biggest megaphone. And what he's using it for is so openly white nationalist and wicked that it's shocking to me that Lachlan Murdoch or one of the Murdochs hasn't said enough is enough. Apparently it's controversial in the Murdoch family. Um, Some of the Murdochs really object to it. But I'm not an expert in what happens inside of that network. I just think what's happening is so tragic for this country. It is, and and if we have a few more minutes, I'd like to just ask you a couple of questions about sort of the news of the day and the differences between Democrats and Republicans following up on, and and maybe between Fox and MSNBC viewers. Um, So let's start with Cuomo, who has just resigned. And what does this say about the difference between Democrats and Republicans uh, who have ignored Trump's many more accusations and let him possibly be the next candidate for president again. Yeah, the difference between Democrats and Republicans is that they used to say that um, Republicans fall in line and Democrats fall in love, right, with politicians. (laughs) I think the reality is Democrats fall in like. (laughs) Democrats don't fall in love. Democrats don't worship our politicians. We can respect them. Look, I, I worked on Obama's campaign. I think he's a top 10 president. I wouldn't drink hydroxychloroquine if he told me to. I wouldn't 
you know, a shine uh, a, a laser light inside myself to cure COVID if he said, I think he was nuts if he said that. I mean, I, w- I wouldn't be willing to follow him off a cliff. Like, you know, we, we can respect, we liked, we all were, you know, a lot of us when we were young, we loved Bill Clinton. We thought he was great. We wouldn't die for him. There's no politician I would die for, period. But Republicans are literally willing to die for Donald Trump. I've never well, seen anything like that. That's a cult. That's not politics. Yeah, that's they the are actually, they politics. are dying for him because of the information about the vaccine. Um, what about January yeah. 6th and the failure of any Republicans to really support the January 6th investigation? You know, David Frum uh, famously said, and I'll paraphrase it because I don't have the exact quote, that when, when Republicans learn that they can no longer win by democracy, they won't turn against the strategies they've been using to try to win. They'll turn against democracy. And I think that's what's happened. You know, the Republican Party is a minority party in the United States. About 22 percent of Americans identify as Republicans. About 29, 30 percent identify as Democrats and the rest identify as independents. They are a shrinking party that is almost all white, um, is demographically almost locked into the South. Uh, and then a few other states like Wyoming and Iowa, they're losing majority everywhere among young people, even among young white Americans, they're losing ground. Um, Americans are becoming less evangelical Christian because they're looking at the church as hypocritical increasingly because of their support for people like Trump. And so they're losing in every way. And what they're doing is rather than change themselves, they've decided to go for minority rule, do the South Africa strategy to try to rule over the objections of the majority. And the thing that's frightening to me are two things. One, is this anti-majoritarian ethos and anti-democratic, small d democratic ethos inside of the Republican Party, which is sort of eliminationist. It's saying, we want, we've want we lost the culture, so we will try to seize control of the culture by force. We've lost the politics, so we will seize the politics by force. And we don't care what the majority wants. We're just gonna rule. It's what's happening in Texas. We're gonna rule as a minority and the way that we'll stop the majority from coming back is we'll make it impossible for them to vote, make it impossible for them to come back into power, even though they are the majority. And the thing, the other thing that frightens me is how passive Democrats are about that, of how little, of how little uh, outrage there is on the Democratic political side about, they don't seem afraid nearly enough of what the Republican Party has become. Um, it's frightening what they've turned into and that the Democrats don't seem to be reacting to it and don't seem to be fighting it as fiercely as they could. Well, that raises the next issue um, because I am outraged about all of that. And I'm outraged that Congress adjourned without passing any voting rights legislation, uh, without addressing the filibuster, without having President Biden come out strongly for changing the filibuster, at least for voting rights, which I think is in a category by itself. But um, what do you think about how important it is to get rid of the filibuster, to protect voting, about passing voting rights, and what can and should our audience, because uh, we have a lot of activists in our audience, so yeah, you know, we appeal to a younger population through Victor, and uh, what can they do to get out there and make a difference and remind them how bad things were before the 1965 Act um, and how bad they are now with the new laws being passed. Well, and don't undersell yourself, Jill, and through you, because let me tell you something, my young folks out there, my millennials love you, <laughs> sister, because they know that you as a young woman were out there fighting the boys, right? You in a boys, in a full boys club, um, what you did in your cute miniskirt, <laughs> which I'm not going to let you look, forget that you were in that cute <laughs> miniskirt too, looking cute. Um, so I, I think... Um, yeah, I, I, I worry that the Democrats are passive because some of them are just too comfortable, right? Like the nine or 10 Democrats, because it isn't just Manchin and Cinema, it's about nine or 10 of them um, who just aren't that alarmed because they are comfortable enough that they feel like they would be fine in the minority mm. and in the situation of minority rule. They're affluent, white, and, and, and comfy. And so I don't think they're worried about being in the minority because they're passing the bills they care about, which is things like infrastructure. And I think that they feel perfectly comfortable going into this future that the rest of us are terrified of. 
And activists that I talk to are also extremely worried that they're going to quietly allow vote. The Voting Rights Act is near dead. They're going to allow it to completely die. It's on its deathbed right now. So I think what activists need to start doing is to stop um, just focusing on these politicians and start focusing on who gives them money. Right. There's a lot we can do with boycotts. There's a lot we can do with direct action. Um, there's a lot we can do to it to make it less comfortable for these Democrats to allow our voting rights to be taken from us. We are going to have to be back in the streets. We're going to have to be boycotting folks. We're going to have to be thinking general strikes. We're going to have to be thinking about corporations having to pay a price for not standing up against these voting uh, anti-voter bills. Um, we're going to have to start making some of these companies pay for going along to get along. And I, I, and, and I think once the, the donor base of the Democratic Party is shaken up sufficiently, they'll make these politicians do what we want. And some of them are going to have to see votes withheld. I'm not sure if I were in Arizona that I would even consider voting for Kristen Sinema. Because you, 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 what would be the difference between having her and a Republican? If Democrats just concede that we got to vote for her again because she's a Democrat, that's how she gets away with it. Maybe Democrats should primary her. Maybe they should start thinking maybe she's not the only option. And, if, and, and as, one, as one civil rights uh, um, person who's very active in this movement said to me, if they're going to make us suffer, they should suffer too. Well, they yeah. shouldn't just get our votes. I just had the opportunity to visit uh, the National Civil Rights Museum, and I left there saying I am recommitted to doing something about voting rights because right now the registration among minorities is far worse than it was right after Jim Crow. So we need to we need to do something, and um, I, I hope your advice is taken to heart by our audience. Well, and, and it's an intersectional fight because, you know, they, they, you know, the history of the filibuster, it was always used to stop black people from voting, but they're not satisfied with just coming for people who look like me. They're coming for young people of all races. They're coming for Asian Americans who were key in Georgia. Like, let's not forget, it wasn't just black voters who flipped Georgia. It was Asian American voters, too. So trust and believe that the Asian American community is now targeted as well. It was Latino yeah. voters in places like Arizona. But believe me, the reason that they're doing this mass suppression in Texas is not just black people, it's Latinos who are already the majority. And they know they're the minority um, in terms of Texas conservatives, and they're coming after black and brown voters. So all of our communities of color and young white voters, they don't want young white college kids to vote because they know that young white college kids are voting majority Democratic. So they're coming for all of us. And so it is not just a fight. I think what we got to stop, we have to stop thinking about the civil rights movement as just being a movement about black voters. It's a movement about poor folks who they don't want to vote either because poor people are going to want to get benefits are going to want to get, you know, assistance from the government are going to want to not die in poverty. They're coming for all of us. And so we need to band together, create a huge intersectional movement, and we need to fight back. One last question from Victor, and we'll let you go, although we could keep this going forever. <laughs> <laughs> this has been amazing. Yeah, no, I mean, we started the podcast by asking you about your time in journalism, and you mentioned how um, you really found your voice. And I'm wondering how, what advice you would give to young people, especially as, you know, hearing you describe that. Um, I can imagine many young people perhaps listening to that. Some feel urgent to act. Others may feel cynical or, you know, may, may feel a little bit dispirited by the current state of politics. I mean, what advice would you give to anyone who wants to become a journalist or, you know, an elected official um, on how to do so and especially kind of looking at your path and, and how you got to where you are today? That's a great question, Victor. I would say start with your circle, right? Start with your own circle. Like, uh, you know, Look, I was doing uh, I was doing the readout just in my house with my my family who had to listen to my political opinions <laughs> at, at dinner every night. My poor siblings and my mom were like, OK, go ahead. <laughs> you know, start with your own circle, your own friends, your own social media following. You know, whether your following is 10 people or a thousand people or 100,000 people, start start your journalism, your activism at home. I always say to people, if you want to be a writer, just write. You know, you can get a medium and just write and just put whatever you're 
uh, what you want to say out there on your own, uh, you know, your own social media, your own Facebook, wherever you have influence over the people who know you and then move from there. The second thing would be just to not be shy about raising your hand and saying that you're capable and that you're prepared um, to do a job that you might think, you know what, let me back down from a little bit, right? Um, just remember, Rand Paul is a United States senator. <laughs> <laughs> and Whenever a you doctor. feel that you're not, <laughs> and, and technically a doctor, although don't ever, if you are letting him, he's a dentist, if you let him work, uh, uh, do surgery on your mouth, that's on you. <laughs> you took that risk and you get what you get. So just remember, Rand Paul, whose only qualification is that his dad is Ron Paul, is a United States senator. That Ted Cruz is a United States, he's a senator. Marco Rubio, look at these guys. These guys are not excellent. They're just there. Josh Hawley, who's got all these degrees, but still thinks insurrection is legal, is a senator. So if they can do it, baby, you can do it. <laughs> Just look and at I them on that, TV and look at them on Twitter getting old and you can do it. <laughs> exactly. And I bet that we won't get suspended from YouTube as Rand Paul and Justin. Right. So, exactly. No, and he's is, supposed to be a doctor. He's got a supposed medical degree. Come on yeah, now. Yeah. You can do anything he can do. Yeah. For sure. I mean, this has been such a wonderful conversation, Joy. Jill and I really appreciate your time. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much. It's been so much fun. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Jill. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, audience. <laughs> Thank you. So, Victor, wasn't that an exciting conversation with Joy Reid? Oh, definitely. I mean, I watch her every night and I, and I see her. I see her brilliant analysis and, like I said at the beginning, her drama and her delivery. And so it was wonderful having her on. And what I found particularly interesting, I think, is just how she came up in her journalism career, she mentioned that she started off as um, someone who, you know, just found her voice in journalism and used that for the better. And I think for a lot of young people who may be uncertain about how to start and, you know, make their voice heard, hearing joy might be really beneficial. You know, all you have to do is just kind of use it and then you'll find your way. And like she said at the ending, um, you know, start with your own circles and then that kind of just branches out. And I found that that could be a really nice way to get young people who may be cynical or who may be, you know, um, apathetic about politics to really make their voices heard. Um, how about you, Jill? What was, what did you like about that episode? Well, I, I thought that last piece, piece of advice was really perfect, is to start with the people that you know and try to convince them of your point of view. And listening to her also reminded me of, I took a course in how to write an op-ed, which is geared at making sure that minorities, women and other minorities, get a voice on the opinion pages. And as a result of taking that course, I wrote an op-ed, and that op-ed led to MSNBC contacting me to come on air, and that's what led to my new career as a commentator for MSNBC. So it's certainly worth learning how to do it, and I would recommend, uh, and maybe we can put in our show notes, a link to the um, op-ed project that, course, yeah. that helped me to get ha learn how to write an op-ed that would get published. So mm -hmm. I think it was a great, fun experience to talk to Joy and to learn how she um, has navigated from where she started to where she is as a primetime host, the first and only African-American woman to be in that position. And uh, she does a great job, as you said, worth watching every single night. Definitely. I mean, she, she mentioned so much beyond her um, career in journalism, too. She, one of the things that I found interesting is just how to um, get Republicans or you know, representatives and senators who don't care about democracy to actually care. And she mentioned you know, following the money. I know you probably have a lot to say about this, but what do you think of what she said about how to reach those Republicans who just you know, don't care or, or seemingly, you know, they're, they're more willing to kill their constituents than actually care for um, helping them. You know, we see this with vaccines, but also with this democracy and, and voting rights um, fight. Well, as, as you know, one of my main concerns now is how do we reach people with the facts? How do we return to the era when I grew up, when there was only one set of facts? There were no alternative facts. And there are no alternative facts. Alternative facts are lies. And so to me, we will keep asking all of our guests who are in the media, how do you 
communicate facts? How do you convince people who have a distorted view or a view based on um, incorrect information? How do you persuade them of what the truth is so that they will act on that, both in terms of vaccinations, which is important, but also in terms of who they vote for, whether they're voting in their own best interests? So I think it's, um, it's a really, it was a great episode. And I want to thank all of our audience for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you on our next podcast. We hope that you will listen and follow us and uh, let us know how you feel about it. And if you have any questions you want us to answer, please contact us through uh, Politicon. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much.